What's up? This is Dr. Taylor Crick at the Washington Wellness Center, and today's video is about mold and mycotoxin lab testing. Uh, we've had a, a couple of videos coming out about this recently, and it's my favorite, favorite topic. So if you are a patient in our office, you've definitely heard this. And, and so I don't have you know, very good comprehensive guides out there about this. So I wanted to record a couple of videos recently about, you know, how mold disrupts the limbic system because we see these patients all the time. And then an overview about mold toxicity and then an overview about candida overgrowth and then even an overview about fungal stuff in general. And then, and then I'll continue doing with shorter videos about, you know, remediation and some of the things. So um, here's today's, it's all about lab testing and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, my last video as well, I'm very casual because it is, it is so cold around here. It is below zero and that's without the wind chill. Um, and yeah, it's just freezing. It's not really like snow, like play with your kids type of snow. It's more like snow, like scar your kids for life type of snow, like freezing frostbite. So better come in and record videos because we've got this info and you know we share this all the time. So I did do another video like I mentioned about uh, mold toxicity and mycotoxin illness. And in that video I just mentioned this is just some of the info that I have on my desktop. We have so much experience with mold toxicity in our office and I say we, sometimes I say we and I'm really referring to me. <laughs> Like, uh, this is how we treat things. Like, it's really me. But in our office, it's really a we thing. So Jamie, who works for us, Jameson, a very knowledgeable mold patient and very knowledgeable in home remediation and has just a long history. So we're putting out more and more content and information and certainly seeing a lot of patients with these issues. My gosh, it's so prevalent here in central Illinois. It's so prevalent anywhere uh, in the Midwest or the South where it is humid. You have humid summers. Not as prevalent in Salt Lake and in Arizona and down in the Four Corners. But still, that does not mean that it does not exist. It's just not as prevalent. And science is now discovering. So science meaning the scientific literature is now discovering all the problems associated with mold and with mycotoxin. So go back and watch that last video if you want to know about how mycotoxins you know, cause myriad of different issues, hormonal issues, cellular issues, metabolic issues, how they stay in your body indefinitely, how they store in your cells, you know, all those things. Today's video is just about how to detect fungal growth, mold toxicity, and mycotoxin illness, and figure out if it's what's causing your symptoms. All I'm going to be talking about is what I do because I see this so often and we have a pretty good you know, system of what we do, but there are other people out there, you know, if you're an MD or a DO or you know, a naturopath, maybe, maybe you do different testing methods and so on and so forth. So this isn't to talk about everything, um, but I will touch on you know, some of the reasons why I don't run some labs and why I do run other labs and really what I'm looking for. So with that being said, let's get jumping. So mold versus mycotoxins versus yeast, meaning like what's the glossary first? It is important to have a basic overview of the semantics. And, and once again, I'll say it a bunch more times, but go back and watch the other videos to learn more because you have to get educated on, uh, on what these words mean. So fungus, fungal uh, infection, fungal overgrowth, fungal whatever, a fungus can either be molds or it can be yeast. And we're not going to, I'm not a mycologist I, and I don't really, you know, care uh, with the exception of like, is it causing your symptoms? Because that's all I care about. So, but fungus can be mold or yeast. Mold can grow in damp and dark, water damaged indoor spaces. Okay, so these are moist, they're humid, there's not a lot of airflow usually. Um, and molds can, can grow. And we've probably all seen this, you know, um, you, you know, mold grow on your loaf of bread, mold can grow on, you know, your shoes in the basement, mold can grow on a sofa, mold can grow on, you know, all just all kinds of 
things, and I'm assuming that everybody has seen that. And we know what, we, what we're talking about with this. It grows, meaning like you could leave it, and it could come, you could come back, you know, a year later, and it has grown. And in fact, you know, I, I kind of regretted not saying this in my last video, but mold is such an age-old problem. It's in the Old Testament of the Bible. It's in Leviticus. There are instructions for what to do if your home back then had mold exposure. And it basically says, like, you know, you call a priest and you draw a line or something, and, and if you come back in a few days and the line has grown, you leave, you know. Um, so mold grows in damp and dark spaces. So mold can also colonize the body. So just like when America was colonized, these, these men and women came in, they set up colonies, they set up little communities, and mold can colonize the body and set up little communities, and it likes to grow, once again, in damp and dark spaces. So you think of those places, you know, where it's warm, it's humid, it's damp, it's dark. It's the sinuses, it's the gut, it's the bladder, it's the lungs, it's the vagina. Uh, it's damp and dark, humid, moist spaces. So then mold growth releases something called mycotoxins, which literally means mold toxins. And we're going to talk about those, but once again, in my other video, I go into a lot more detail. I go into the science. I go into some of the different types. Uh, today, we're going to look at the testing, so you'll be familiar with all these things. But mycotoxins damage the brain. They damage the mitochondria. They damage the liver. They damage the kidneys. Um, and, and, you know, much more than that with regards to symptoms and disease processes. And, you know, there's another slide on that later down the, the line. But that's just some of the, the lingo that you can test for mold. You can test for mycotoxins. You can test for yeast. And you can test for inflammation. You can test for, uh, for you know, some of the si downstream side effects. You can test for sensitization. You can test for uh, toxic burden. And all of these things matter because they all, you know, they're different strategies. They're different approaches. So you take, you know, a mold toxic patient to an allergist. They're going to be looking for allergies. And that's often a futile attempt. Um, and so somebody will say, well, I, I thought maybe it was mold that was causing my chronic sinus ENT issues, but I went to the ENT and the allergist and they did some testing and they said, no, it's not. Well, that's BS. That is complete BS. They looked for allergies and you don't have a mold allergy, so they said it couldn't be mold. That is so far from the truth that, you know, good luck telling them that. Um, so testing. This is what I'm going to go through today is just what I do right now. I, I'd like to keep this video a little bit shorter as far as, you know, it's not the end all be all of everything that's out there with Shoemaker tests and, and you know, Marcon's tests and, you know, et cetera, tissue swabs, tissue cultures, biopsies, you know, whatever. Uh, this is just what I do right now. And so for me, you know, first off, you know, I'm a chiropractor, but I also... I don't diagnose or, or, or treat. I, I'm more functioning in a consultation service. It's more education-based. So I'm not trying to diagnose what your fungal infection is. I'm trying to figure out why you or somebody that I see has weird symptoms like fatigue and brain fog and insomnia and vertigo. And so people come to me with these constellations of weird symptoms and they want to know what can they do to get well, and they want to know what caused it, and they want to know what labs they can run, they want to know what supplements they can take, and they want to know what protocols they can perform. And my job is really to educate on, here's what you should do, and here's what it's going to tell us, and here's why I think that. Here are all the signs from your history that point me to believe this is the case. So this is just what I do right now as far as testing. Right now is important because this ain't what I did, you know, few years ago, and it's probably not what I'll be doing a few years from now. It, it might not be what I'm doing a few months from now, but I still think that right now I, I really enjoy this kind of combo of tests with regards to bang for the buck and what we're going to find out. There's a million other things that you can do. You can test, you know, candida antibodies. I do that occasionally. Um, you can do nasal cultures, you can do lung sputum cultures, you can do 
um, you know, just, just a, a myriad of things that are out there. And so this video isn't to say, hey, here's all the things you can do. This is to say, hey, here's what I do through my years of study and, and, and clinical trials of like doing this on patients. And what I think is the best bang for the buck, not to put a name on it, not, but to figure out, is this what's causing your symptoms and making you feel bad? And what direction do we need to go next as far as, you know, fixing this problem? Uh, so my favorite combination of tests for this issue, if I suspect this issue, is one going to be the blood. You know, I often, always rather, you know, I'm testing the blood because there's basic markers on there. And we can also, you can glean so much information from such inexpensive tests. And I think that this is often overlooked in the functional medicine world of like, there's nothing more important to me. There's no test that is more important to me than a CBC and a metabolic panel. Um, CBC with differential, you know, there's different names for a metabolic panel. I'm talking about a complete metabolic panel. I think sometimes they're called you know, chem 20s and chem 14s and different things, but a metabolic panel with liver enzymes with kidney filtration rate and, and CBC. So I'm looking at a combo of three tests right now oftentimes. One, a serum test. Two, a urinary organic acids. And three, a urine mycotox test. So that's largely what today's video is going to be about. Now I did throw in there at the end, I do do some Cyrex, um, Array 12s and some mold IgG and some infection IgG and you know some other some other things so I did throw those in there but so what do I want to look at in the serum so first off like I mentioned CBC metabolic panel boom boom big time um, thyroid markers you know are we seeing signs of what's called a pituitary pattern especially um, C-reactive protein you know inflammatory markers Homocysteine, which is a methylation marker. Methylation is very important for detoxification. Methylation is also very implicated in mold and chronic toxicity, heavy metal, you know, cases. So I want to see, you know, on their CBC, I want to see their MCV. I want to see their homocysteine um, for methylation. TGF beta, I really like seeing TGF beta. Now, are the Shoemaker tests. That's really one of the only ones that I do. Now, what does that mean? So Dr. Shoemaker is very, the most famous person in the mold world. Not everybody does his protocols, but he is for sure the most famous. And he does these, these pretty advanced blood tests. Now, I am a self-pay cash office. So if we did Shoemaker Labs, it would be $1,500, you know, at least probably for that panel. So I look at some of the basics. I don't look at MSH. I don't look at, sometimes I look at C4A. I don't look at VEGF. I don't look at MMP9. I don't look at VIP, um, you know, very often with any of those. So, but TGF beta, I do. Um, ferritin, vitamin D, uh, LDH, you know, sometimes even just uh, looking for blood sugar imbalances, mitochondrial, different things. But so just basics. And now let's leave it at that because I think that there are other videos talking about some of these basics. What do they mean? What do I look for? I do this in any case, whether I think it's fungal or not. These are the things that make people healthy. These are the things that make you more susceptible to COVID. These are the things that make you more susceptible to everything. Um, urinary organic acids as a number two. And once again, this is nonspecific. And so with those serum markers, they're nonspecific. So if any one of those are off, Lots of things could throw those off. But we're starting to put this picture together with these puzzle pieces of like, tell me, tell me about your history and tell me about, you know, your symptoms. And then we start looking. And so as we, you know, uh, start putting this puzzle together, more pieces come in that just kind of tip the scale towards us thinking, yeah, this is fungal um, for sure. So in the urinary organic acids test, or what's called an OATS test, you can see indicators of colonization, and we're going to go through a bunch of these, but colonization, meaning has mold begun to grow in the gut, and we're looking specifically in the gut with this test, but has mold or candida colonized and begun to grow in this area? But then the oats, all, and that's all I'm going to show today, 
But the oats also shows many other markers that I find really, really helpful in this, you know, patient and in this space. Because a mold toxic patient, they're likely going to have different signs of mitochondrial imbalances. They might not be able to lose weight or they might not be able to get out of bed and they might be chronically fatigued or they might be like crossfitting five days a week and still gaining weight. You know, rapid sudden weight gain in a history is like mold red flag. Um, you know, symptoms starting, if somebody says, oh, my symptoms all began right in 2007. Um, my first question is, oh, when did you get married? Because that's probably when you moved into your first house and it probably wasn't a very nice one. Um, living in a basement, red flag. Multiple symptoms in one family, red flag. Any ENT symptoms, red flag. So just throwing those out there. Um, but mitochondrial imbalances we will see on an oats test. And, and I'm very good at explaining what those mean. And I have some even shorter old like whiteboard videos about some of the things that we see with uh, you know, lactic acidosis or impairment of the Krebs cycle and the inability to burn fat. And, and these things that are known, mold is a known, mycotoxins are known causes of these things. And it just jacks up your mitochondria. We'll see neurotransmitter imbalances. So things like dopamine especially, um, serotonin too. But especially dopamine, a lot of neurotoxins impact dopamine. And we'll see detoxification impairment, meaning signs on an OATS test that somebody's having trouble detoxifying. And these things often match up with the patient's symptomatology. So somebody might come in with fatigue and brain fog and ADHD or depression or OCD or insomnia, or they might have multiple chemical sensitivity, like they hate candles, they hate perfumes. I'm like, huh, they probably have some problems detoxifying and clearing toxins out. And sure enough, we'll go and we'll look on the test and we'll see, yeah, that, that is the problem. We need to support this. But, but you know, our, our goal is still to look for what caused it in the first place. And that's where we get more specific. And that's with number three, the urine mycotoxins. So I didn't put a description there because this test tells us one thing and one thing only. Do you have mycotoxins present? And I, often when I'm interpreting this with a patient, you know, it might be an hour, 75 minute appointment. And that only takes five minutes to tell them that or one minute. This test looks for one thing and one thing only. It's mycotoxins. And yes, you have them present. And so we'll spend the next 70 minutes talking about what they are and what they do and where they could come from. And here's what we have to do next. And, you know, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big thing, but it's just really, really common. So testing, uh, you know, once again, these fungal problems. So uh, the digestive tract is often overgrown with a commensal yeast called Candida albicans. One of those shouldn't be capitalized, but whatever. Um, and, and, you know, that's just really, really common. There's other problems, you know, but it's due to a history of a high sugar diet, you know, standard American diet, and antibiotic usage. So if you don't fall into that category, then you might not be American. Um, but most people fall into that, you know, category. Uh, and maybe if it's women, they'll maybe have a history of, of oral contraceptives and these things that disrupt the gut microbiome. And we talk about this all the time and I draw this all the time and how there can be bacterial overgrowth in the gut. But what is more common is fungal overgrowth in the gut. And so what happens is, let's say in the past, let's say you've used antibiotics in the past, you know, 10 times. And maybe it wasn't even for the gut, maybe it's for a sinus infection. And you use these antibiotics and they wipe out the bacteria, they kill off the bad the bacteria, the bad ones that are causing the infection and the good ones. And it doesn't do anything to the fungus. So then it's like the fungus is like, we got the whole house, you know, mom and dad are gone. We can come out and party. Like they come out and then they grow and they spread. And they, you know, the, over time, these, these commensal bacteria just become more and more and more. And the party gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it starts causing symptoms. So candida and then you feed it with sugar, and it's like, oh, yeah, I'm really liking this, and alcohol, and then it keeps growing and growing and growing. 
Candida colonization is one of the most common, if not the most common, root causes that I see. Um, you know, it's hard to say what's the most common because we never see just one either. Um, but sometimes that's candida colonization with mold toxicity. And sometimes it's without mold toxicity. And it's hard to say, but, you know, it, it, it can be one or the other. And some of the signs of that are sugar cravings. You know, I'll, I'll tell patients, what if your sugar cravings aren't you? Because they're like, gosh, I don't know why I do this. I, 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 you know, I just get these cravings and I can't, I don't know why I'm not stronger. I don't know why I don't have more willpower. And it's like, well, yes, but what if it's not your fault? What if it's not you? What if it's the candida and the yeast in your gut saying, feed me, I'm starving. And, and then it's like, oh, gosh, that, that's kind of empowering of like, I, and I never try to take the responsibility off the patient ever. But it is like, boy, what if it's not your fault, but it's still your responsibility? Uh, digestive complaints, you know, bloating, constipation, brain fog, common, common candida thing. Um, fatigue, common candida thing. Hormone imbalances, common candida thing. And metabolism issues, common candida thing. So what does it look like on, on tests? So here's an example. So you see up here intestinal microbial overgrowth, yeast and fungal markers. And so for this person, let's see. Aspergillus, high. Aspergillus, high. And then number seven, arabinose is the candida marker. So sometimes we will see candida markers high with other markers for mold or fungal overgrowth. Sometimes I will just see arabinose high. Sometimes we'll see some of these others high without arabinose, but it is the most common marker. So this person has an indication of aspergillus mold colonization of the gut. We're starting to see these markers get high. Now, this one, the high is above 14, it's 21. Not that much higher, but still, cause for concern. There's three highs. The next one, 16, it's 19, okay, enough to get an H by it. The next one, the high is 29, it's 33, enough to get an H by it. Anything's a concern when it's an H. I would even call this one an, uh, a concern because it's approaching out of that box. But it's not like in my space especially, you know, it's not like you're taking something, one thing for candida and then another thing for aspergillus. We're using herbs and, and essential oils and natural products. So we, you know, we take kind of the same things for all of these. This tells me a 30,000 foot overview. There's colonization, there's fungal colonization of the gut of candida and mold. And when we see these molds, there's likely mycotoxins being produced as well. So we're going to correlate all these things together to help paint the clinical picture for the patient. Here's another one. Uh, some of the same markers, you know. So once again, uh, this marker's high. This is a, a, a different one. I believe. Maybe it's the same one. Let's, yeah, same one. Um, above 16, now this one's 31. But now we're getting here to this tartaric acid. And above 4.5 is high, 31. Really, really high. And then higher here for candida. So what's this person have with relation to the last person? Same thing. And a little bit more, you could say. But certainly fungal overgrowth. Now, when we correlate this with, with mycotoxin testing, there, there's a pretty good chance, I think I remember who this person is, uh, that we'll see things like okratoxin or aflatoxin or these aspergillus-produced mycotoxins um, on their mycotoxin test. Here's another one. Um, so once again, you know, the tartaric acid getting high there, 19, the arabinose number high 58. So, you know, twice as high as the reference range there. So here's another one that is really high, right? So with this aspergillus marker, we want it to be below 14. She's pushing 140 or he, he or she. Um, here's another one. We want this marker to be 16. 160, 10x, 10x the upper upper limit. Uh, here's another one that we want it to be low. It's a, it's a little bit elevated. And here's a rabinose again, 67. Now this person, I do know who this person is, and so 
this is their follow-up test you know, down the road. So it just goes to show that that's not a forever thing, that these things can absolutely be approached and addressed. And when we, when we get a follow-up test like this, what it means is that the colonization has been addressed, but they could still have mycotoxins that could have accumulated. You know, these aspergillus species, who knows how long they've been there. Let's say they've been there for a year at that high of level. Okay, they've been producing mycotoxins for a year at that high of level. There's probably a lot of mycotoxins. Let's say you got those when you were 10 years old and that number has been growing and growing and growing and now it's 10x the, the upper end and then you've been accumulating mycotoxins at an exponential rate for 10 years. Well, your detox journey is going to look a little different than somebody else's. And so while we may get rid of the colonization, it is really, really important to do that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're out of the woods. The detoxification is really important. So molds, whether in the body or in the home or in the car or even in the environment, you know, growing on dead leaves and stuff, but they produce mycotoxins. And they do that as a defense mechanism. So they do it when they get ticked off, you know. And so they do it, you know, not as much out in the, the you know, woods. Uh, but they produce mycotoxins when they get disrupted. So mycotoxins are low molecular weight. So they're really small. They're tiny. They're invisible. They're microscopic. They stick to stuff. So they stick to your walls, they stick to your clothes, they stick to your carpet, they stick to your books. I'd mentioned in the other video that it is not uncommon in the mold world to say that somebody should leave their environment and take nothing but their ID. Because um, mycotoxins can stick to stuff. And so sometimes you leave a house and you take your box of stuff with you and the mycotoxins have just followed you from one place to another. It's kind of like secondhand smoke too, that you could stop smoking but it still stays stuck to stuff. Um, and they can get inside your cells where they can remain indefinitely. So that's the scary thing. And then they do things like uh, bind DNA and alter DNA and RNA communication, protein metabolism, uh, disrupt mitochondria, you know, just jack everything up, seriously. Uh, here's, here's a chart that just shows some of the molds in the aspergillus family and the mycotoxins that they produce, some of the things that, that those are associated with. Once again, that other video way goes into this deep. Ogrotoxin, very common. Um, nephrotoxic, damages the kidneys, damages the liver. And, and, you know, did I mention, let me go back up. No, I think I'm not there yet. Okay, so, um, yeah, and then here's another one, you know, same thing, stachybotrys, that's uh, trichothecenes. These are uh, very dangerous. It's black mold, toxic to humans. Um, ketomium, heavy mold. You know, I mentioned these in the other video, so I don't want to say the exact same things. Um, and yeah, so mold and mycotoxins can impact the body in many different ways. And, 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 you know, this is all, once again, in that other video, but I'm leading to what we can test. They can activate uh, inflammation, which is more driven by the innate immune system. Um, so, you know, if you scratch my arm and it starts to get inflamed, that's all the innate immune system that's just rushing to that right away. The adaptive immune system takes is a little slower response. Um, and, yeah, and so sometimes... Mold can trigger an adaptive immune response, which can lead to autoimmunity, can lead to allergies, and eventually does trigger innate inflammation. But they're two different things, and sometimes it triggers adaptive, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it suppresses the adaptive immune system and does the exact opposite. So you don't have an immune system to fight off things like you know, COVID or Lyme disease or Epstein-Barr or, you know, so on and so forth. And then mold can, uh, and mycotoxins, so it, it can trigger inflammation. It can trigger the adaptive immune system that leads to autoimmunity, leads to allergies, leads to hypersensitivities. 
and then it could also cause toxic overload. So we can test the, all three of those different areas. And that toxic overload is when they begin to accumulate on a cellular level. They damage the mitochondria and the brain, the liver, the kidneys. Associated with things like chronic fatigue, hepatitis, kidney disease, bladder cancer, allergies, asthma, sinusitis, IBS, IBD, anxiety, depression, vertigo, tinnitus, autoimmune diseases, and, and a lot of other things that are just like crazy. So go back and watch uh, the mold mycotoxin video and go back and watch the limbic system video if you want to know about some of these things when they start getting real crazy and complex. So you could potentially test. So when looking for mold, when looking for mycotoxins, especially mold, you could p test cultures. You know, and, and that'd be probably the gold standard of like, do you want to know exactly what's growing is get it cultured and then get it looked at, you know, under a microscope of mycologist, histologist, whatever would do that. Um, probably like a microbiologist. But um, you can culture that. You can look for IgE antibodies. That's true allergy. Very rare. Um, and you can look for IgG antibodies as well, which is a delayed inflammatory response from the adaptive immune system. And, you know, we're going to look at, at some of those. Uh, and then you can also look at some of the inflammatory markers. So these are going to show that somebody's inflamed, but they might have mold, they might have Lyme, they might have both, they might have metals, and, and, and they, all of these could be elevated. So TGF-beta... Commonly elevated in biotoxin illness, uh, inversely correlated with glutathione. So when TGF beta is high, glutathione is low. Um, I think, is there a couple of these that are in here? I felt like I added a couple of these, but maybe I never got them in. Um, but yeah, urine mycotoxins. Uh, so, so anyway, those inflammatory markers, those are more of the shoemaker markers, TGF beta, MSH, VEGF. VIP, complement protein, C4A, um, and then urine mycotoxin, all those are options. So some of the basics, and, and so I, I mentioned this a little bit, but because of the different ways that mold can trigger inflammation, CBCs can be all over the place. So with the complete blood count, sometimes you're high neutrophils. So what's that mean? Like a, a neutrophil count over you know, 70% um, or maybe even over 60%, you know, you start to see these high newts and low lymphs. High newts and low lymphs could be autoimmune and to be more of the innate inflammation, not so much the adaptive inflammation. Now, th that whole ratio could go the opposite. So typically, high newts and low lymphs is an indication of a bacterial infection. Whereas a viral infection would be the opposite. Mold can mimic both of these. So sometimes it just triggers a lot of innate inflammation. Um, and then sometimes it could be the opposite. So high lymphocytes and low neutrophils. And sometimes, you know, uh, once again, I'm, I'm mixing these up, but it can go any different direction. So sometimes it's suppressing the lymphocytes and they could be low. Sometimes it's elevating the neutrophils. Sometimes it's doing the exact opposite. And the point is that almost anything out of the ordinary could be mold. So the CBC is not exactly the best test for it, but it's a great place to start to kind of understand the mechanism of what's driving this inflammation. Um, the other thing on the basics is looking at the metabolic panel, like I mentioned. So some, one of the things that are, some of the things that are huge red flags are things like elevated liver enzymes, AST, ALT. Because um, then we think, boy, something is stressing the liver. And I find these all the time. Um, and lowered kidney filtration rate. So maybe somebody has a lower GFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate. Now, real quick rant about this marker. First off, it's, it's really common. You know, I've found probably five in the last week. And, and a lot of times it might be mentioned to somebody like, oh, your kidneys are a little low. We're just going to keep our eye on this. What's not mentioned to them is categorically, if you're above 60, I think if you're 60 to 74, you're called phase two of kidney disease. If you're below 60, you're phase three of kidney disease. When I say that to people, they're scared. 
when the docs say it to people, they're like, oh yeah, your kidney, we gotta keep an eye on your kidneys. See you next month, see you next year. And they don't say anything. And literally the standard of care literally is to observe them until it gets bad enough that they need dialysis. And I've seen people, you know, in their 70s, I've seen people in their 30s, I've seen people all, uh, anywhere in between with this stage three, stage two, kind of borderline. We see it jump back and forth when we monitor these. Sometimes it'll improve 20 points, sometimes it'll go down 10 points, but overall we can see, we can see that it improves. But all these things make me suspect mold when it's like, hmm, so I don't say, oh yeah, this is mold. I say, hmm, something's damaging your detox organs. And if your liver and your kidney, and it's, it's very rarely both of them, it's one or the other, and aflatoxins are going to be more damaging to the liver, and ochratoxins are going to be more damaging to the kidney, and you know, so on and so forth. But um, yeah, something is stressing your detox organs, and we can see that when we look at the basics. But so some of the m sources of mycotoxins, because that's what we're going to look at next is mycotoxin testing. And, and once again, that other video, uh, it says it right there. So it could be from your house, that could be your basement, common, bathroom, common, attic, common, crawl space, common, could be your bedroom, could be your kid's room, could be your mattress that you got from your grandma that, you know, whatever. Um, it could be in your HVAC, it could be all through the, all through the ductwork, that, that, that sucks. Um, or it can be like on the coil. Um, where there's a lot of condensation that happens. Could be, you know, where, where there's a plumbing problem, um, of course. Uh, but yeah, weird places that you, don't, that you don't tend to think about. Could be on dust, you know, if you just have a dirty house. Um, could be at your office. Sometimes we start talking about somebody's history and it's like, oh yeah, I, your house sounds suspicious. And they're like, you know what, now that you're asking me all these questions, I think it's my work. Um, could be your car. You know, I had somebody recently, hopefully you watched this video, you know who you are, but um, she said, boy, my, and her anxiety is so much better, so much better. And, 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 but she said, I still have it a little bit when I drive. I said, huh. And, and I said, have we ever, and she's found mold, we found mold, she's done remediation work at her house, her and her husband, they, you know, this has been an ongoing thing. Um, and doing really well, but still when she drives, I said, huh. Wonder if there's mold in your car. And I mentioned this in the other video. I don't want to repeat all the same stories, but you know, you just think about how many times it's rained. Let's say it's rained in the middle of the summer and you're soaking wet and you get in your car with wet boots and wet clothes and wet coat and you shake it all off. Then you pull home, you pull into your garage, your windows are up and you leave it sitting there. And let's say it's 100 out and your garage is not air conditioned, so your garage is humid and it's enclosed, and you know, mold can grow. You know, um, snow right now, your car gets wet. Like I mentioned in the other video, wet gear is like a part of my life. You know, I grew up skiing, I grew up playing hockey. I, I, like I said, I would be outside playing today if it wasn't like negative 10. Um, and yeah, so it could be anywhere, or it could be the colonization like we mentioned. That's where you can be getting these mycotoxins from. So there's two labs that are the most reputable. That's what we're going to get into. I've been using them both. One is Great Plains. I use Great Plains for a lot of things. All those uh, organic acids tests were from Great Plains. I used to use Genova. So I go back and I try these things, you know, and kind of compare uh, companies and, and, you know, find out what other practitioners are doing and, you know, all, all this stuff to figure out what's the best route. But Great Plains, and they're two different test methods, and, and I only say that to illustrate that they tell you two different things, um, but Great Plains is looking at mass spec, and Real Times is looking at ELISA, and I'm not going to go into the nuances and the details of that, but even, I think that, that you know, in, in the world of, like Chevy says they're better than Ford, and Ford says they're better than Chevy, of course they both say that and believe that, but I think that even in this space, they both admit, and a lot of the biggest people in the mold space so they both have their value. They're testing for two different things in two different methods. Um, so they both have their value. And some people, like Dr. Neil Nathan as an example, he likes to test both on patients. Um, so, you know, I don't just because of budget concerns, but sounds like a great idea. 
So here's some examples. So this is the old mycotoxin test. Uh, we'll see some of the new ones from Great Plains. So you see over here the type of mold, aspergillus, sterigmatocystin, MPA, um, and, the, and so aspen, the asp, and, and, and then stachybotrys. So aspen is, they often run together, the aspen and, and aspergillus and penicillin families. So ochratoxin, very, very common. So we want to see it below 4. This number is 6.27, so into the red. Uh, this one, you know, we want to see it 1.7 or, or, oh, less than 1.75. And it's into the red, but still not that high. Neither, none of these are that high is my point. Into the red, but not that high. Now let's look at another one. Here's Zarelinone. This is from Fusarium. Zarelinone is an endocrine disruptor. It's an estrogen mimicker. It can cross the placenta. Um, and you see here we want it to be below 10, 60. So we're getting to be some high numbers there, right? Um, here's another one, ochratoxin. We want it to be below 20, and it's 67. Now this one, we're also seeing measurable amounts of aflatoxin. We're also seeing measurable amounts of stigmatocystin um, up into the red. We're also seeing measurable amounts of MPA. So it's certainly some mycotoxins there, one that's really quite high. Here's another one, ochratoxin. This is the new format that it looks like now, but under 7 we want it to be, and in the abnormal we're getting up to 32. Here's another one, same marker, 32 is high, 105 is higher. Um, so, you know, these numbers do matter, um, but, but sometimes the numbers are higher than others, and sometimes there's various reasons for that too, and sometimes this testing kind of throw this out in the middle here. This testing is really tricky. Sometimes even the first test will be lower than the second test. These toxins are very, very sticky. And sometimes in your body, like they don't want to be detoxified. So sometimes when we start to upregulate detox, we actually start to free these toxins up. The labs can also can actually jump up and then start coming down. It's crazy. Uh, but there's all kinds of nuances to this. And when we find these labs high, it just tells us that there is, there's, there's, sim or there's a toxin. We base a lot of the recovery on your symptoms, too. Of if we get this number down but your symptoms start to resolve, that's a really good sign that we're decreasing the total burden of these toxins. But they are crazy. And some people do do um, challenge testing. You know, I dabble with it a little bit of like, you can do glutathione challenge, or I like it if somebody's tested right after they've used our sauna. Um, it will mobilize these toxins. Ochratoxin, very common. It's nephrotoxic, it's carcinogenic, it disrupts dopamine, you know, so on and so forth. It also is implicated in bladder and kidney cancers. It has an indefinite existence in the cells, it has a 30-day half-life in the, in, in the blood, it disrupts mitochondrial ATP production. You know, it's uh, associated now with autism. You know, blah, blah, blah. There's tons and tons and tons. Here's one, uh, citronin. So citronin comes from aspergillus and penicillin and other molds. So, so multiple mold species produce citronin. Um, you see 38.65. Then here we see citronin, you know, another one that's just 84. So we see these numbers do matter and they change. Um, and their relation, their relativity matters. And here's one uh, MPA from penicillins that, you know, we want it to be below 37, and we're at 566. So that's a high number, right? And that's a big problem. And this person has a, has a big problem, um, and her symptoms reflect her big problem. And, you know, it, it's a big issue. So now here's the here's the the other one. So comparing these, this is mine, um, which you know, kind of you know, it, it sucks when I got this. I was super not stoked, but <laughs> you see, I mean, it's it's kind of depressing, really. You know, you look down, it's like, oh, ochratoxin. I measure that in people all the time. Not present. Aflatoxin present. Uh, trichothecenes present. Gliotoxin equivocal and xarelinone present. So, and I have a whole history of mold exposure, 
um, known mold exposure. I had no idea that I would have these, this many different mycotoxins. But I, my symptoms have improved dramatically. I, I've had a great year. So I'm very happy with, with where I'm at with my mold detox journey. But I, it's still an ongoing journey. Um, and I still continue to do labs like this and continue to look at these numbers to see, are these going up? Are they coming down? And, you know, where, 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 where am I at with these numbers? But here's my lab. So okra toxin, you know, it certainly wasn't zero. But aflatoxin was higher, um, trichothecenes, gliotoxin, I didn't put my xarelinone up there. Um, but yeah, you know, big concern. Um, and yeah, once again, I could go into my, my history about how it matches up perfectly with mold toxicity. And when I had a big exposure a couple years ago, I, I, I had the sickest year of my life. I, I, uh, I had to take, you know, I hadn't taken any pharmaceuticals in like 10 years. I had to go to the ER, I had to go to the ENT, I had to be on uh, steroids. I had like probably a month, it might have been two months, where I didn't, I couldn't sleep without NyQuil. It was, it was wild, and looking back, it was really wild. I was really sick. Um, and, and yeah, so sucked. Um, here's another one, it's not mine, but you know, you just see once again high numbers here. Um, so aflatoxin especially very, 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 very high. Ochratoxin very, very high. Um, trichothecenes high. Gliotoxin high. And here's another one just to show you that they're not always that astronomical. Um, here's some that are, you know, zeros, zeros, and some that are getting up there um, as far as ochratoxin, aflatoxin, things like that. Um, so that's mycotoxin testing, urine mycotoxin testing. The last one that I do want to show, because I do do it occasionally, is looking at mold uh, sensitization, meaning has the immune system remembered mold? Now, this is common. This is never my first test that I go to if I'm like, oh, I think you have mold. Let's test Cyrex Array 12. It's more of like, wow, you got some crap going on. We need to kind of figure out all the different craps you have going on. Because <laughs> Cyrex Array 12 is the multiple pathogen panel, and it looks for things like parasites and Lyme and mold and Epstein-Barr and, and, and cytomegalovirus and, um, you know, oral pathogens. It just looks at a variety of different pathogens. And... So sometimes we see mold sensitization. So if we see this, then when this comes back, I immediately forget about everything else and think, uh-oh, you got issues. And these people often will also often have autoimmune disease because it means that mold has triggered an adaptive immune response, meaning that your adaptive immune system remembers mold and any time that you're exposed to it, it's going to flare it up and it's going to remember it. And then it might just flare up your adaptive immune system in general, T-cell reactivity, uh, there's tissue re cross-reactivity. It's not good. So aspergillus, penicillin, stachybotrys, what we're looking at is IgG titer. So you see EBV, CYP, that's hep C also, um, CMV, HHV6. We, we see these all the time with things like, you know, Alzheimer's and neuro, neuro diseases, these, these herpetic viruses, Borrelia, you know, on the next page of this is the co-infections, Babesia, Ehrlichia, Bartonella. Um, and yeah, so just, you know, sensitization to mold. Here's another one, sensitization to mold um, and not good. Also sensitization to hep C. Um, and CMV. So this person has, once again, a big, big problem. Um, her body's remembered mold. She probably has mold colonization. She certainly has mycotoxin accumulation through, not from this test, but, you know, through other tests. Um, and yeah, it's a big, big, big problem. And for this person, quite frankly, this is going to be a forever problem. Um, 
you know, they can make certainly huge improvements, huge improvements, but they got forever stuff that is never going away and, and, and is always going to have to be addressed. So that is mold and mycotoxin testing. There's a lot to it. Uh, I didn't cover everything. Uh, there are others um, that probably exist. But this is really, really good of if you, let's say you watch my last video and you're like, boy, could my symptoms be mold? Sounds like it. They're crazy. I have a history of sinus infections. I have a skin rash. I have fatigue. And I have brain fog. And I have this, like, these hormonal imbalances. Yes, it could be. Uh, now, it could be a lot of things. Lyme and mold, their symptoms often overlap. So both just really crazy. Um, but let's say you're looking at, okay, where do I need to go from here? Well, match up these symptoms, start to think about your history, start to think about some of the, the toxin uh, clusters, uh, symptom clusters, and then we can move into some testing like this and we can begin testing. You could go straight for urine mycotoxin and then it lets you know what the cause of the problem is. Guess what you still need to know? How your mitochondria are functioning, how your gut's functioning, how your neurotransmitters are you detoxing, and you also still need to know your CBC and your metabolic panel and your vitamin D and your methylation and your inflammation and your thyroid. Those things uh, we need to know for how do we solve it and what all is disrupted and what all you know, do we need to address. But the urine mycotoxin tells you, hey, this is what started the fire. This is what caused the fire. And now you, it, it saves you a lot of time, a lot of trouble. Now, let's say also, let's say you also have Lyme. Well, you're never going to fix Lyme while you're living in a moldy environment or while you have mycotoxins. So this trumps everything else. Let's say you have metals. It's not uncommon. It, this trumps everything else. You have to get rid of the mold before you can get rid of other things. Let's say you have autoimmunity. You've got to get rid of the mold. You can't dry off while you're still in the shower. You've got to figure this out. You've got to get into your environment. You've got to get somebody out testing. You've got to test your body. You've got to find all the different sources. You've got to use some of the at-home DIY mitigation strategies to try to keep your exposures to a minimum and keep your bucket as empty as possible. It is a big, big problem, but the reason that we do these videos, the reason I'm really, really passionate about it is because it's affecting so many people. They don't know where to turn. The internet is full of good resources, but also full of a lot of junk. They get paralysis by analysis and they wind up making no progress. So the point of these videos is to give you some idea of the next direction you need to head. If you need any help with any of this, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to you know, take you on as a patient or give you access to any of these tests or, you know, that's the purpose of, of course, the website and the articles and the videos and all the stuff. But love, we'd love to help you and get some testing done if that's something that you're curious about. Go back and watch a bunch of the other videos. There's a bunch of other ones that are really, really relevant. Um, and yeah, keep solving your own health puzzle.